want to welcome all of you here. Those of you that may not know me, I am Pastor Tony Walliser. I'm one of the pastors here at Silverdale. And if you're visiting here today, you have chosen probably the best day of the year to visit Silverdale Baptist Church. And the reason why is this is Vision Sunday. You go, Vision Sunday, what's that all about? Well, um, every year for months, um, myself and our pastoral staff, we will pray and just simply ask the Lord, Lord, what is your vision for your church? And every year, God gives us a new vision, a direction for our congregation. Every year, God is so faithful to do that. And I believe he's done that again for us today. Now, you may go, why is this so important? Well, the Bible says that without vision, people perish. What does that mean? That without vision, we get derailed. Without vision, we get distracted. Without vision, we get sidelined. Without a vision for your family, your children will rebel. Without a vision for your marriage, 50% of them fall apart. Without a vision for your workplace, your job's gonna become a chore. Did you know that God has a vision for you and your life? God has a vision for this church. He does. In fact, you know, the fact is, is this is his church and God's got a vision for it. I love how Jesus says this in Matthew chapter um, 16, verse 18. The Bible says this. On this rock, Jesus says, I will build my church. This is Jesus' church, right? I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus says that this church belongs to him, and he's going to build the church, and the church is going to be so strong, you know what it's going to do? It's going to literally go into the gates of hell, knock down the gates of hell, and rescue people that are perishing. Now, I don't know about you, I want to be a part of that kind of church, because that's the kind of church that Christ wants to build. And it's essential that Christ builds that kind of church. Do you know why? I'll tell you why. Because in the United States of America, 3,700 churches close their doors every year. And so we need Christ to come to work in our midst and to build this church. And the good news, he is. I just want to say, God is glorifying his name in and through the ministries of Silverdale Baptist Church. It's incredible. I mean, literally, what God did this past year is unprecedented in our church history, the way that God worked. At this time last year, I shared with you that the theme for our church year was going to be multiply. And I had no idea all that God was going to do. I mean, it's humbling to think right now that Silverdale Baptist Church has nine weekend worship services around town. Nine. I mean, last year, we started our North Ottawa campus. Um, Also, our St. Elmo campus, uh, you know, launched another worship service there. And we have seen growth like never before. Another amazing thing is in the past year, 2017, we saw over 500 people come to faith. That is breaking down the gates of hell. And we're literally seeing lives and families being transformed through the power of Jesus Christ. But it's not just growth that's multiplying. I mean, our small groups are multiplying where discipleship is happening and people are growing in their faith. I mean, our ministries are multiplying where our our folks are joining God and serving in all different kind of ways. And our missions are multiplying and we are literally touching not only the city, but the ends of the earth through the ministries of our church. So I just wanna say at the very beginning, To God be the glory, great things he has done. Can we just worship Christ and say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for building your church, Jesus. Amen. But let me say, God's not done. I believe God has greater things yet to come for our church. And that's what I wanna share with you today, our our vision for 2018. But what I wanna share with you is more than just 2018. I believe that this vision is from 2018 and beyond. And that's why I've called it our 2020 vision. We believe that God wants to accomplish these things in the next 24 months, that by the time we are in the year 2020, these things are gonna be accomplished and starting in our um, church. Now, whenever you hear 2020 vision, probably the first thing that comes to your mind is what? Eyesight, and it is, it's a play on words. Most of you have probably seen an eye chart before, right? And so whenever you're at an eye chart, you're supposed to be able to see that top line at 100 feet, You're supposed to be able to see the third line at 50 feet, and you're supposed to be able to read the um, sixth line at 20 feet, and if you can, you have 20-20 vision, okay? Now, only 35% of us have naturally 20-20 vision. The rest of us need glasses or contacts or surgery or that kind of thing in order to have true, good 20-20 vision. 
Um, most of you know that my dad grew up in Switzerland. Now, I've been to Switzerland. It is a beautiful country. It really is. But my dad could not appreciate the beauty of his homeland. Why? Because he was, you know, his vision was so bad. Whenever he immigrated to the United States, he soon joined the Air Force. And one of the first things they did is they gave him an eye exam and they go, you're almost blind. And so they put glasses on him. And my dad says the very first time they put glasses on, he's like, it's like I'd never seen before, you know? And then whenever he visited his family again in his homeland of Switzerland, he goes, oh my goodness, I lived there all those years and I couldn't appreciate the beauty that were surrounding me all along. Well, I believe it's the same way with us. That so many of us, because we don't have God's eyesight, We don't really see what God's doing all around us all the time. And so what I really want us to do as a church is to have God's 2020 vision. God wants us to have his spiritual 2020 vision to see the world the way he sees the world and to see people the way that he sees people. Now you may go, well, what does that look like? Well, today what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at one story where we're gonna see how God sees people. It's found in the Gospel of John. So go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of John chapter four. And then also, take out your Bible study outlines. They're found in the center of your bulletin. You're gonna wanna follow along and take notes on today's message. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna see one encounter. It's a very popular story of Jesus' encounter with a Samaritan woman at the well. You're probably familiar with it. But let me set the story up for you, okay? Samaria is in the center of the promised land, okay? And then North of Samaria is what we call Galilee. That's where Jesus did most of his ministry. That's where Nazareth is at. And then south of Samaria is Judea. That's where Jerusalem is at. That's the religious hub of the Jewish people. Now, good Jews would never go through Samaria. They considered it pagan land. And so what they would do, they would cross over the Jordan on the east, they would go east of the Jordan, and they'd cross back over if they're gonna go to Galilee. Why? Because no good Jew would ever step foot in that pagan area called Samaria. Now, you may go, why is it that there was such animosity between the Jews and the Samaritans? Well, it goes back like 700 years before. In 700 BC, the Assyrian nation conquered the promised land and took in exile all of the Jews. Now, what they did is they repopulated the land with these pagan people. So whenever the Jews came back from exile, back to the promised land, some of them intermarried with the pagan people that were there in the land. Those are the Samaritans. They were half-breeds. They were part Jew, part pagan. You know, the, the Jews would call them, you know, mongrel dogs, you know, muggles, if you use that term. I mean, they're half-breeds, okay? The fact is, is that the Jews hated them because they were impure, And they're like, you know what? They're pagan land, and we're not even gonna put our foot on their pagan soil, so we'll never even go through Samaria. And so there was this incredible hatred that existed for 500 years between the Jews and the Samaritans. Now think of this. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, stepped into that kind of racism, stepped into that kind of segregation. And what does he do? He crosses every barrier. Jesus Christ knocks down every wall. Why? Because he sees people differently than the way that we see people. And so what I wanna do today is I want you to see how God sees people and so that we can have his 2020 vision, all right? So I want you to jot down these several things on your outline. First thing is Jesus crossed geographic barriers. Jesus crossed geographic barriers. Jesus would not allow somebody's location to keep them from hearing the good news. So look at how this story starts off. Look at it in John chapter four, verse three. It says, he, that's Jesus, left Judea, that's the region of the south, and departed again for Galilee, that's the region of the north of Samaria. And look at it, and he had to pass through Samaria. In your outline, circle had to. Now we just said you know, that most Jews did not go through Samaria. They didn't have to. I mean, you know, why is Jesus going through Samaria? I mean, why is he doing that? I mean, when you read the word had to, you go, okay, was the other road blocked? Was, was the Jordan River flooded and Jesus couldn't go that other way? No, Jesus had to, and I'll tell you why Jesus had to. Because there was a woman there that needed the gospel. That's why Jesus had to. 
You see, Jesus had long since circled this day on his divine calendar. He knew that he was gonna meet a woman at the well that needed Jesus. You see what Jesus does? Jesus doesn't allow his culture to dictate to him or geographical locations to keep him from doing what God's called him to do. Now think about Jesus' ministry. Jesus was constantly on the go. I mean, he was always traveling. You read the gospels. He was going from city to city, village to village, house to house. Now, he didn't have to do that. I mean, his hometown was Nazareth. He could have sat in Nazareth and he could have said, you know what, if you're really serious about God, you come to Nazareth and I'll tell you about the kingdom of God, right? You you see, that's the way the religious leaders operated in Jesus' day. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they sat in Jerusalem and they said, you know, if you're really serious about God, you come on to Jerusalem and we'll tell you about God, right? But Jesus didn't operate that way. Jesus said, no, I'm gonna go to where the people are and that's why Jesus is in Samaria because there's a woman there that would have never come to Jerusalem. And so Jesus is going to where she's at. Now what's sad about today's church is that we operate more like the religious leaders than we do Jesus. We build a church and we say, y'all come on in here. And if you're really serious about God, you come here, right? That's not how Jesus operated. Jesus said, no, I'm not allowing anybody's location to keep them from the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. The first barrier Jesus crossed was geographical barriers. Second barrier that Jesus crossed is this, jot this down. Jesus crossed racial and gender barriers. Jesus crossed racial and gender barriers. Now, I've already said that there was this huge animosity that existed between the Jews and the Samaritans. The Jews look at them as half-breeds muggles, right? And you know what? The Samaritans, they hated them right back. They did. In fact, there's actually documented cases where Samaritans would sneak down into Judea on the Jewish festivals and they'd throw pigs over the, the temple wall to defile their festivals. I mean, there's crazy animosity going on. Listen, for 500 years, this kind of bigotry and racism and hatred was taught to generation after generation that existed for 500 years. You you know, you think about the segregation that happened in America and our Jim Crow laws, they don't even come close to the hatred that existed between the Jews and the Samaritans in Jesus' day. And yet, did Jesus allow that to keep him from doing what God wanted him to do? Absolutely not. Jesus crossed over every racial barrier that existed. Check it out, look at it. It's found in John chapter four, verse seven. A woman, Jesus was sitting at the well, a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? Jews, for Jews, have no dealings with Samaritans. This woman, she sees, Jesus says, give me a drink, and this woman's shocked. Why? Because Jesus has broken two cultural rules. One, he's talking to a Samaritan, and two, he's talking to a woman in public. That would have been beneath a Jewish rabbi, and yet Jesus crosses all those barriers and says, you know what? I'm gonna talk to this woman. You see, what I love about this is that Jesus didn't allow his Jewishness to keep him from his godliness. Let let me put it to you like this. How did this woman know Jesus was a Jew? I mean, Jesus didn't say, hey, I'm a Jew. No, no. He dressed like a Jewish rabbi. That's how Jesus Jesus dressed. Jesus embraced his Jewishness, and yet he didn't allow his Jewishness to keep him from his godliness. And he didn't allow his race to keep him from reaching other races. That's the point of God. And that's what we need to understand as well. I, I love the way that Pastor Tony Evans puts this. He said this, quote, he says, God's not asking white people to become black and black people to become white. God's not asking white folks to like soul music, and he's definitely not asking me to like country music. (laughs) I love that. Don't deny your race. Here's the key. But don't let it interfere with God's call in your life. You see what Jesus is doing here? Jesus says, I don't care what racism has existed for 500 years. I'm the son of God, and I'm breaking down all these walls. I'm here to bring the gospel to everyone. And she's like, what are you doing? I'm not the kind of person you should be talking to. I'm not from the right background. I'm not living the right kind of life. And yet Jesus said, I don't care about all that. I care about you. So Jesus broke down those walls. There's a third barrier that Jesus overcame. 
Jesus crossed religious and moral barriers. Jesus crossed religious and moral barriers. You see, the Jews and the Samaritans had two different religious systems, and yet both of them were looking for a Messiah. And so what does Jesus do? Jesus looks beyond her religion and even her immoral lifestyle. We're about to see that. And Jesus sees her as a person and loves her. And what is he going to do? He's going to reach her. Now, he's going to correct her religion. He's going to correct her lifestyle. But he sees her and loves her and reaches out to her. Most religious leaders of his day, if they would have known that she was an immoral woman, they would have treated her like a leper. But the good news, folks, Jesus touches lepers. And he touches this woman. Check it out. Look at how Jesus does this. He starts with her physical need. He's talking about physical water, right? And then he moves to her spiritual need. Check it out. Verse 13. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. So he's talking about her spiritual need and she wants to know more about this, right? And so look what she says. Verse 15. The woman said to him, sir, Give me this water. And Jesus is. But you know what? He, he's got to deal with an issue first, her sin problem. He's got to touch a real sore spot. So what does he say? Verse 16, Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered, uh, uh, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, uh, you're right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one that you now have is not your husband. Jesus is saying, yep, you got that right. You have no husband. You've had five husbands and the one that you're living with right now, um, he's not yours. He belongs to Mrs. Jones down the road. And suddenly this woman's exposed. Jesus has just read her mail and she knows that this is a divine encounter. And so what does she say? This is her conclusion. Check it out, verse 19. The woman said to her, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. I mean, you just, you just exposed my soul. You know everything about me. You must be a prophet. And then later on, Jesus is gonna say, no, I'm more than a prophet. I am the very Messiah you're looking for. Now, here's the deal. Most of us as Christians will say, oh yeah, we, were, we really wanna save people's souls. We do. But here's the problem. We don't treat people like people, Right? See, the reason why Jesus had such quick access to this woman is because he was willing to put his Jewish lips on her Samaritan cup. Do, do you understand? It would have been unthinkable of his day for a Jewish man to put his clean lips on the unclean cup of a Samaritan woman. But because he treats her as a person, as someone worth dignity and love and respect, suddenly he has quick access to her life and her need and her soul. So many of us, we want to bring people to heaven, but we don't want to walk with them here on earth. Jesus said, we've got to be willing to bring down all the walls and start loving people the way they really are. Every person you come in contact with is someone who's made in the image of God. Every person you see is somebody who Jesus Christ has died on the cross for. If God loves them that much, so should we. No matter what their lifestyle is, no matter what their background is, no matter what their race is, Jesus said, you start loving people the way I love people. You take your blinders off, start seeing the world, I see the world. That's what Christ is calling us to. Now, if you know how this story ends, you know this woman comes to faith in Christ. And she immediately rushes back into the village, the people she's been avoiding, and she's telling them, here, come and see this man who's told me everything about me. He, he, he's, he's probably the Messiah. Come and see. And you know what? The rest of the village comes out, encounters Christ, and it's a miracle. An entire village of Samaritans come to faith in Jesus Christ. It's crazy cool. Now, what I want to do is I want to contrast Jesus with his disciples. The way this story is set up is that Jesus has sent his disciples into that Samaritan town to buy lunch, okay? So what does that mean? That means that while the disciples are going into town, this woman is coming out of town. So they literally crossed each other on the road. Did the disciples talk to the Samaritan woman? Of course not. Why? Because they don't have God's 20-20 vision. They got their blinders on. They went in town. They were interacting with Samaritans to buy food. Did they say, hey, good news, the Messiah you've been looking for, he's right by the well, come and see. No, why? Because they got their blinders on. Here's the sad reality. Most of us as the church, we look at the world more like Jesus' disciples than like Jesus. 
We've got to start getting the blinders off and start having God's 2020 vision for the world. In fact, Jesus' words to his disciples at the end of this story is Jesus' words to us. And this is really our theme verse for the entire year. Check it out. It's John chapter 4, verse 35. Jesus says to them and to us today, look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Three times, what does Jesus say? Look, lift up your eyes, see. Take the blinders off. Stop seeing people the way you've been seeing people. Start seeing people in the world around you the way that I see people. And when you do, you'll see a harvest come your way. That's our 2020 vision, that we as a church start seeing people the way that Jesus sees people. Now, as a pastoral staff, there's four very specific goals that we as a church want to do in order for us to accomplish this 2020 vision. And I call it Reach 2020. And so for the next 24 months, we as a church want to accomplish these four goals. And as we do, we're gonna be more effectively reaching into our community. And so I want you to jot them down. Here's the, really the four goals of our Reach 2020 vision. First goal is this, jot this on your outline. First, we want to continue reaching the next generation by building a new Creekside Worship Center, which also will double our space to reach more youth in our student ministry building. Now, let me unpack that for you. Four years ago, our church was growing, but we were not reaching the younger generation. We were not seeing 20-somethings and young couples come to faith in Christ through our church. And I knew something as a pastor. We could continue like that, but within a generation, our church would be dying. And so we decided we're gonna change our approach in ministry the way that we, we do things. And so we started at that time, four years ago, at 11 o'clock, a Creekside service. In our student ministry building across the creek, we decided we would launch an 11 o'clock service there specifically designed to reach the younger generation. And you know what happened? Within six months, it was packed out. They were bringing chairs in. And we were seeing young couples and young people coming to faith in incredible ways through our Creekside service. And so we're like, okay, uh, we need to start another one. We didn't know when to start it. And so we said, well, how about 8.15 in the morning? And so we started a 8.15 Creekside service over there as well. I just preached there. It was packed out as well, 8.15 in the morning. And we're seeing unprecedented ways of us reaching this younger generation. But now we got a problem. You got two Creekside services that are full, right? And then it created another problem. It's in the student ministry building. What does that mean? We've sort of handcuffed our student ministry because you got an 815 Creekside service and 11 o'clock Creekside service. That means that all the youth ministry has to happen in between that. And they are completely packed out and out of space as well. And despite that, it's amazing to see what God's doing in our youth ministry. Oh, it's incredible. This summer and this fall, I mean, literal revival was happening among the students around this place. I mean, so many of them coming to faith. It was just incredible what God's doing. And so we're like, okay, we got a real space issue. God's working in incredible ways in our young adults around here and our, our youth ministry, and yet we're out of space. So what are we gonna do? We decided, okay, the way we're gonna solve that problem is build a new Creekside worship venue. And so what we're gonna do is literally across the creek, you know, directly facing our present student building, we're gonna be building a, um, a building there, our new um, Creekside worship venue. We're hoping that we'll probably hold around 600 people or 650, something like that. And um, so our two Creekside services can continue to grow. But the cool thing about that is because that one building solves two problems. Not only is that gonna give room for our two Creekside buildings to continue to grow, but um, worship services continue to grow, but also now that enables our student ministry to not be locked in. They're able to literally double in size and they're gonna have space to grow as well. And so that's the first goal that we have. Now, our academy, Silver Baptist Academy, the school, they're also making plans of building a gym over there as well. And so they're doing separate fundraisers to try to build gyms and other classrooms and that kind of thing. And our goal is, is that this fall, we will start building on that building. And if we accomplish that, I believe as a church, we're gonna to continue to reach the younger generation, all right? That's goal number one. Goal number two is this, jot this down. 
We want to more effectively reach the world around us, the unchurched, by building a coffee house, which will serve as an alternative worship venue where we can interact and reach the unchurched. Now, you, you go, coffee house, what does that got to do with church? Well, let me unpack that for you, okay? In generations past, um, the church was the center of the community. The church was the place to go. The church is where you know, people would connect relationally. But that's no longer the case today. It's just not. In fact, Barna Research says that 20-somethings who used to attend church, um, 61% of them no longer attend church. Now, some people will hear that statistic and they'll go, well, what's wrong with this generation? And my response is, is what's wrong with the church? So the church is no longer meeting the needs of this generation. And whether we like it or not, coffee houses have become the gathering places of our community. It just, it's become that in our culture. It's like, you know, coffee houses have become, you know, postmodern wells. <laughs> I mean, think about it. What was Jesus doing at a well? Jesus is at a well because that's the gathering place where culture would cross. Well, coffee houses happen to be those places where our culture will cross. And so following Jesus' example, we're going to build a coffee house for our church. Now, um, really for our community. You know, where's it gonna be located? God's already provided prime location for us. We have one acre of unused land that is right there on Bonnie Oaks, right next to the New Wendy's. 17,000 cars cross that area every day. 17,000 cars. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna build a coffee house. Rather than building another church building where people may come possibly once a week, we're gonna build a coffee house where our culture and society are gonna cross with us seven days a week. And not only that, we're gonna use that coffee house as another worship venue. People that would never step and darken the doors of a church can be invited to that coffee house and go to a worship service there. They're gonna come for coffee and they're gonna find Jesus. And it's gonna be amazing. And I'm so stoked by how God's gonna use us to reach the unreached generation around us. That's goal number two. Goal number three is this, jot this down. We want our church to take the lead in reaching our city and community by using all the profits from our coffee house to fund partnerships touching the inner city. Our church is the largest church in the tri-state area. And Jesus said this, to whom much is given, much is required. I honestly believe that God is calling us as a church to take the lead that we as a church would take the lead in reaching our inner city, to breaking down all the racial barriers and walls that have existed there from generation to generation. Isn't it time? Isn't it time those walls went down? We as a church have to take the lead in doing that. You go, well, how's that going to happen? We already have dozens of incredible partnerships with amazing ministries that God's using um, partnerships like YCAP and Urban Partnership and Community Kitchen. Um, we're, we're involved in Howard High School and, and Donaldson Elementary School. Of course, we have our Hispanic ministry. We have the food bank there at um, our St. Elmo campus. We have dozens of amazing ministries that God is using in incredible ways. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna continue those partnerships, but we're gonna take all the profits from our coffee house and it's gonna to continue to fund those partnerships. And you couple all that new resources with all the volunteerism of our church and I believe that our church is gonna start making headways and the barriers and the walls that have existed in this community forever will suddenly begin to start coming down over time. That is what I believe God's calling us to do as a church. There's a fourth goal that I feel like God wants us to do as well, and it's this. Number four is this. We want to reach Apison by purchasing land for a future church campus. Apison is about to experience a population explosion, and we want to be prepared to reach these new families for Christ. Advisors tell us that the next big growing area in Hamilton County is going to be the Apison area. I mean, it's going to be blowing and going with so many new homes going on there. And yet here's the sad reality. There is not a growing church in that entire area. There's not. 
And so what we wanna do is over the next two years, we're asking God to provide land for us. We're hoping 10 acres of prime property there where we can eventually you know, launch a church facility out there. Um, now, the, the fact is, is that land prices are starting to escalate out there, and so we wanna get the land now. Now, let me be real clear. We are not launching a new campus in two years, okay? We're just getting the land now, and we're hoping maybe in five years we'll be able to launch the new campus in Appison, but we gotta acquire the land now while the land is available. Now, those are the four goals that we have as a church. Now, those are all amazing goals, but they all come at a premium price. As you know, our church is extremely conservative when it comes to finances, but we anticipate for us as a church to reach those four goals, it's gonna take about four and a half million dollars. Four and a half million dollars. You go, well, how are we gonna raise four and a half million dollars? That's where you come in, right? And it's true, you get to join God, folks, good news. And that's really what I want you to do. I want you to start praying now. And for the next six weeks, I'm just calling all of our church to join me in praying over the next six weeks and just asking God a simple prayer. God, how do you want me to get involved? God, what do you wanna give through me? God, what sacrifices do you want me to make in order that I can give? Now, you don't have to give all at once. Over the next 24 months, over the next two years, we're, we're saying, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give toward this 2020 vision over the next two years. And I believe that if all of us sincerely ask God's direction and, and we hear him speak to us and we all give and obey as he's told us to give, we're gonna raise more than four and a half million dollars. And we're gonna accomplish all these things by 2020. Now, folks, it's amazing. God's working in incredible ways in our church, and I just praise him for it. God loves his church here. But let me just say, God doesn't just see on Sunday mornings the 4,000 people that are gathering in the nine worship services this weekend. God sees the 150,000 people in this community that will never darken the doors of this place. God sees them, and he loves them, and he wants us to see them and love them as well. Watch our theme verse, look at it again. John 4, 35. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are wide in the harvest. As Jesus is saying, remove the blinders, start seeing people and loving people the way that I do. That's our 2020 vision. Let me close with this. Um, years ago, there was an old magazine that had four consecutive pictures the first picture was this vast wheat field in um, Kansas. And all you could see as far around was this beautiful wheat field. The second picture was a distraught mom. It was evening time and her son had wandered from the farmhouse into the wheat field. And her and her husband was searching desperately for their son, but because the child was small and the wheat was tall, they couldn't find him. The third picture was a picture of the community. The family, the friends and neighbors had come out the next morning and they sort of joined hands and they began to start sweeping through that, that wheat field looking for that child. And the fourth picture was the heartbreaker. It had the, the dad holding his lifeless son who had expired that night because of the cold air. And it had this caption underneath. It read this way. If we'd only come together sooner, he wouldn't maybe be dead if we'd only come together sooner. Let me tell you, there's a vast field of lostness all around us. Jesus sees them. He wants us to look, lift up our eyes and see them the way that he sees them. And if we will, and if we'll reach out to them, you know what's gonna happen? This vast field of Lostness will become a field of harvest that thousands will come to faith because we as a church decide we're gonna start seeing the world the way Jesus sees the world. That's our 2020 vision. Let's start seeing the world the way Jesus does.